Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Let's talk about some of the recent research that has uh, come up concerning uh, what happens to the brain at the end of life and how this might be related to your theory. Right. Um, so uh, uh, in anesthesia, we use brain monitors that, that measure EEG. We, we use simple electrodes here because it's, it's too difficult to do uh, 32 or 16 electrodes. So we use these simple stri strip electrodes on devices that were designed to measure depth of anesthesia. Mm -hmm. And uh, they process the, the, the data. They take EEG. They take maybe a, a muscle tone of the forehead. They don't really tell us what they what they take because it's proprietary, but they give a, a number, mm -hmm. zero to 100. And um, uh, 80 to 100 would be awake. So presumably if we measured ours now, it would be between 80 and 100. Uh, they, they say that if the, your patient under anesthesia is between 40 and 60, they're not awake. Mm -hmm. And these were designed to prevent awareness under anesthesia. Mm -hmm. uh, there's problems with them because they're telling you what happened a couple minutes ago. So I personally don't use them because I, I don't want to know what happened two minutes ago. I want to know what's happening now. Mm -hmm. But they're, they're useful and a lot of people do use them. Now, uh, a doctor named uh, Lakmir Chawla at George Washington University, who's a palliative, he's an intensivist and uh, a palliative care specialist and takes care of people as, as they die. So if someone's terminal, and they and or the family make a decision to uh, withdraw care. Uh, Charla wanted to make sure they were comfortable and uh, to give them painkillers if they needed it or just, so we started using these, br these brain devices mm -hmm. and what they found was that, that some of them were, um, were already at, at low levels, in some cases brain damaged and, uh, or, or even brain dead. Mm -hmm. And uh, th they put these numbers on. Although, um, and what they found was that in, not in the brain dead uh, subjects, but in the other subjects, what they found was that this number would dwindle, say from 50-ish down to about 10 when, or, or below when the heart stopped. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't, it, it, there's a little noise, so it never actually goes to zero. And, and then when the heart has stopped, the blood pressure is gone, or there's no blood pressure, uh, they, they saw in a good percentage of patients, about half the patients, a spike uh, or a, a sudden uh, upsurge of activity uh, when, the, when the body was, was dead. Mm -hmm. And uh, as far as anyone can tell, of course, defining clinical death is another question. But um, when they analyzed this, uh, th so the number went up to, in some cases, 80 to 100, mm -hmm. but uh, above 50 in, in, in a general upswing. And when they analyzed it in the machine, it was, it was highly coherent. And in fact, gamma synchrony, uh, which is a, a marker of consciousness, and in fact, even, even very high frequency gamma, above, above normal gamma. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, some people say, well, it's just the last, the last ditch uh, gasp of neurons firing and not firing. But it's not firing, it's actually gamma Synchrony and it's coherent across both hemispheres, so it's it's hard to explain that. Uh, it, it's hard to account for the fact that um, that this could be uh, uh, just uh, random last ga gasp activities. Mm -hmm. So you know what does it mean? Well, you know some people say you know some people would like to believe it's the soul leaving the body. Uh, it could be. We don't really know. Mm -hmm. We don't have a good explanation otherwise. But it's something that can be studied and looked at in the future. It reminds me of a phenomenon that's been discussed quite a bit amongst uh, parapsychologists with whom I interact called terminal lucidity. That uh, uh, It's been observed clinically that uh, people shortly before they die, uh, I observed it with my own mother who had Alzheimer's, but shortly before she died she entered into a state of hyper-awareness and uh, where she was extraordinarily articulate and uh, it's, as, it's as if uh, something like that sort might be going on. 
Yes, and uh, Peter Fennick, who has uh, studied uh, death and dying for many, many years and is very articulate on this, uh, talks about deathbed experiences. Mm -hmm. And uh, I actually saw this with my mother, and I had heard Peter speak about it, and I was, it was a very moving, uh, where, where, where uh, people who are terminal in their last days or even weeks uh, often are sort of half here and half there. They're being, well, we don't know where, but they they're appear to be in communication with deceased relatives mm -hmm. and, uh, and almost uh, 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 are annoyed that you're, uh, that you're uh, distracting them. And I saw this with my mother, and uh, she, uh, just shortly before she died, she just started talking to my father, who had been dead for a l many, many years, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and didn't really, and kind of ignored me, and, and didn't really want to, and, and was just addressing him. I mean, he, at the foot of the bed, presumably, mm -hmm. she saw him, and uh, they were, he, she was carrying on half of a conversation, and uh, I was amazed, because it, it was so much like what Peter Fenwick had described in many, many subjects. So it's not just, you know, here or there, it's, it's a fairly common phenomenon. Mm -hmm.